Uh, yeah, are there questions from the audience? Yes. Um, I think you have quite successfully shown what happens in the vertical case. I'm wondering if, if there is any kind of potentially even uh, not destructive but constructive cooperation that can happen in the horizontal motion case. And uh, to this, going a little bit more, maybe more extreme, what do you think, uh, maybe a little bit more provocative, if you will, uh, what do you think needs to happen for this to be brought outdoors? Mm. Interesting. <laughs> so as a horizontal case, I think, uh doesn't matter if you fly at low speeds but could be very important once you go high speed and so that we haven't really done because uh, we still have trouble flying high speed with the low and front motors we have because they have very low thrust to weight ratio but that's kind of interesting now taking it outdoors i think there's many exciting applications to it like one thing I'm personally interested in is the sort of inspection tasks that you have, let's say, a wind turbine, something like that, and you want to inspect it. You have to, of course, take into account what the turbine itself is doing. But also, if you inspect it fast and you have multiple robots, uh, what will happen? Or if you need multiple tools uh, for the inspection, for example, one that shines a light and the other one to take a, a valid picture. So, what's going on with the atmosphere? Yes. Um, so I think, uh, in principle, from a learning perspective, we have now at least developed the tools uh, to train efficiently and then apply it in real time, but it requires a lot more data um, and to bring it to the real world and make it useful for applications. More questions? <laughs> So are there plans to use uh, to 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 add the camera to the drones and you use it for navigation or I hope so. Okay. <laughs> Not sure if either the one doing it, but um they are already quite successful groups that of course are able to fly autonomously using vision-based navigation. Um there's also this whole new trend now with event-based cameras so that are in particular interesting for low light uh, conditions. Um, what I'm personally more interested in is how do you deal with cameras uh, if you fly in kind of those close formations, because then you also have dynamically moving obstacles, so to speak, in the yeah. field of view. And what about, uh, so the um, one of the topics as Outlook was high dimensional space uh, and with the cameras in mind and also maybe unseen objects. Um, I would be very interesting how added objects, whatever objects there could be added, um, how they will influence the whole uh, the whole planning and trajectory planning. Yes, exactly. Those also if you from like the last portion from the aerodynamics perspective, there's also an effect on the ground effect. Where you if you fly close to the ground or even to the ceiling, there's things changing. You can imagine if you fly let's say in a canyon or something close to a wall, there are also effects. So that's a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course if it's instead of here where we kind of assume that we know the relative state vector if it's based on sensing. Then we have additional uncertainty in your relative state estimates. Frequently, we can estimate them. If we have, for example, a filter, it could maybe tell us uh, an estimate plus a covariance of it. But then also the question is, can we actually include this uncertainty directly in our machine learning model mm -hmm. uh, for prediction? Mm -hmm. And maybe also to use some other sensors, such as the LIDAR, or maybe only cameras available. Because I mean, right now for this trajectory planning, there's really popular people is trying to use the different sensor data and try to fuse them. Mm -hmm. And that should be and that also maybe a potential direction for the future work. Yes, exactly. And the, again, for the single robot groups, there's quite many who look at autonomous vehicles. Um, LIDAR was quite hot a few years ago. I think it's less hot now because it's kind of heavy, so you can't put it on very small platforms, and it's also pretty power hungry. 
I, I would blame Elon Musk for giving the lead. <laughs> Maybe also, but there's also like, I think you have from the through the operating fog and so on, that it, like sometimes it, it has quite some issues too. So uh, in the first part, you showed that from the global planner, you take lo local observations and then you use the barrier term to ensure that uh, things don't collide or don't get into a deadlock. And uh, so my question was, if uh, you have seen one global environment, but then if you place the drones in an, another global environment to uh, like in a different environment, does the uh, barrier term itself suffice to make sure that you don't get into deadlocks again? There's no formal guarantee that you won't get into a deadlock, of course. Uh, and I think it's impossible to prove it because you can always create a counter example uh, if you have limited observation. Uh, empirically, what we have shown is that it's surprisingly good. Just on, but of course, we kind of tested in similar uh, environments. So we looked at scalability, like we added more robots, but we tested on the same kind of environments with 10 or 20 percent obstacles randomly placed. <laughs> are the, um, sorry if I maybe have missed this, but are the observations uh, encoded before uh, before there are the inputs to the neural net or something? Yes, so right now all observations are just relative state vectors. So mm -hmm. it would be just kind of the distance vector between the robots for the position, and then in some of the neural networks, we also have the relative velocity. Okay, okay. okay. But, um, so the, the uh, input space di uh, dimension doesn't seem too high to further encode it, um, so that, uh, such that similar states would be closer together because of the encoding, and then the decision is maybe the same even for unseen data. But... Yeah, I agree. I think it kind of always depends how much data you have and how much time you want to spend on training. Yes, always. Uh, so kind of like, for example, the last thing I showed you is something you can train on like a laptop in an hour. So it's, you know, like you try to do those things where you don't have to spend a lot of money and time yeah. uh, to be successful. Actually, to your question, I'm wondering if you considered looking into the direction of contrastive loss or uh, look into the loss function specifically to see if, uh, you know, being further apart from the target uh, is better, is beneficial essentially for, for uh, learning more general representations, this kind of approach. I don't know if you know any, if you, if you, if you work with contrastive losses. No, we have actually not played around with the loss functions at all. We only played around with like the sensing radius, which would be a hard cut off um, yeah. pre processed data. I see. I see. Yeah, that would be some direction to look into. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Any more questions? Um, I, I, have, I have one starter question. You showed. Um, uh, where where you where you basically said that you stuck with the with the deep sets? Can you go back to that one? I like that very much because I was that's why I was running around. I was actually trying to find somebody who might be interested in that, but unfortunately they're not here. <laughs> so causes is all about exchange. So one of the one uh, you're you're already saying any continuous permutation invariant function can be approximated. What would be if the the uh, function is not permutation invariant. So, for example, change a sign. Why would that not be permutation invariant? And I mean, uh, if, if you permute something, not the not the whole, um, not the whole uh, sum, but uh, terms in between change sign, and you only have a global. Um, global uh, symmetry that you have to obey. 
Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, it's a good question. Like different like function structures that we can do something. The the reason for that is what what we have in in um, we have, we have one person here actually two now. Tobias Dornheim, who is looking into the so-called fermion sign problem, which is another anti-hard problem. And there you have global um, constraint on that sum that you're computing there. That, for example, it's anti-symmetric in total. There's continuous function and it has to be anti-symmetric. And you, uh, the easy part that, uh, uh, or, or he has been developing very efficient algorithms to uh, compute very large sums uh, of this case. And it would be very nice to actually talk to him. Unfortunately, he isn't here today. So that's one of his, his, his basic things to come. These would be called uh, Gaussian sums that you're doing now, uh, or, or uh, bosonic sums, sorry, bosonic sums. And the other one would be fermion sums in the, in the uh, quantum mechanical sense, and they behave differently. So bosonic sums are easy. Fermionic sums are not that easy, and it would be very interesting if we could extend what you're doing there to, to these technologies. Right, but if you just want to enforce certain properties of your approximation, you can also enforce a structure. In That's why I was right. saying. You like here is just a feed forward neural network, mm -hmm. but you could do like a symmetric mm -hmm. um, function, for example, and then you can enforce properties. Now, if it's still can approximate any of such functions is an open problem. So then we would need to go back to the proof and check if it would still pan out. Um, because going on to that, what, what is underlying all of these, and what I understand, and, and this was my additional question, the interaction potential or the interaction between your drones is velocity dependent. Yes, exactly. Okay, so that does that makes things more complicated, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> But in the end, I mean, uh, in uh, one of the strengths we have here, and one of uh, being a physicist myself, this is a, to me, this is basically just a, a, a multi body interacting uh, system. Yes, yeah. Where I have uh, time, space, and in your case, also velocity dependent interaction potentials. Yes. So you have, first of all, of course, external forces and external potential. That can be time varying, and you have some some form of uh, internal potential, and this is a very standard uh, thing for any multi uh, multi body uh, uh, physicist to deal with. What we are mainly doing here is quantum systems, mm -hmm. which have uh, the additional problem of uh, 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 problems with with uh, uh, assumptions in, in stochastics, basically. But I, I think there would be a lot of fruitful uh, uh, interplay between those. Looking yes. at this in a Lagrangian way, looking, looking at all these things and, and seeing if you, for example, what we always do is that we uh, basically take a, take a mean Path and then uh, uh, at the at the interaction potentials to higher and higher order. Right. Uh, the more drones you have in a small area, the higher the sort of in our case exchange correlation potential becomes. And computing this efficiently and finding an efficient representation for us is all that we need because otherwise it's a pure simple linear system that we can solve. And then it's just the interaction that we have to take care of. So. I would love to. That sounds that, awesome. That, yes. that was where I was like getting giddy because this is all physics to me. It's <laughs> <laughs> motion planning. <laughs> and the nice thing is exactly that motion planning is 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 what what we would do. It, uh, so so in the Lagrange formalism, we basically have an optimization between a, a starting point and an end point. You can also put this in Hamiltonian and do the same thing. And then it also become, uh, depends on the interaction. So it's basically, a, 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 it's, it's one of those standard inverse problems in physics that's really hard to learn and really hard to do. So I could see a lot of interaction between those two different systems, because what you're basically doing with your drones is you're sampling a, 
a high dimensional interaction space with certain endpoints mm -hmm. and optimizing this on a on a on a least action or or, or something something like that approach so I, I think there's a lot of interplay there where one could shamelessly steal again okay well, sorry but i was just getting giddy <laughs> Because I think a lot of your technologies could actually be applied to these systems and also maybe vice versa. Excellent, yes. But the problem is the uh, velocity depends on the. Oh, you can first start with solving a simple problem. It's already hard if you remove the velocity. Yeah, yeah, the velocity depends leads to big problems. Um, yeah, and the other thing is, uh, and I'm for, I wrote him an email, but for some reason he's just working. He's talking to Michael Hecht, who has been working a lot here on um, global optimization problems in uh, high dimensional spaces. So he, he does not do it, he, he can better tell you yourself. Okay. So, so I hope we have some time with him as well. Otherwise, you have to come back and back and back and back <laughs> and we come to you. Okay. Any more questions? If that's not the case, thank you very much, Wolfgang. This was a wonderful talk. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, I hope we still have some time this afternoon to actually talk to each other.